three lessons on language from watching BBC shows. First, just because you know a word in English doesn't mean that you'll notice a family resemblance in other words, unfamiliar ones. Two great words that I heard in a recent BBC detective show set in Northumberland were abattoir and stroppy. If you are smart, and I mean SMRT, stop the video right now and tell me what these words mean, abattoir and stroppy. I had never heard them before. Stroppy threw me for a loop completely. One somewhat less educated character, shall we say, said of another something like, he was being a bit stroppy with me. He could have said loppy or noppy with a K or froppy, and I would have understood just as well. Stroppy was just nonsense syllables. All I could gather was that stroppy was an adjective describing an unpleasant state in which some person could be. So, of course, I looked it up. Turns out it comes from obstreperous, a word I do know, obstinate and volubly so, that's what the word means. To be stroppy is to be stubbornly pushing back against someone in a loud and annoying way. Should I have figured this out? I don't think so. The connection would have required just too many leaps. I did not know the word stroppy, and I don't want to take the blame for it, even though I did know the word from which it came. It's, you know, family member. I got something similar to say about abattoir. I could tell from the context in the show, they were standing inside a slaughterhouse for producing meat. I could tell that abattoir is indeed just a British word for slaughterhouse. Or judging by its form, it's almost certainly a French borrowing. But if I'd heard the word in another context that didn't give such obvious clues, I simply would not have known the meaning of the word. If I'd gone to Britain prior to seeing this show, and someone had said to me, hey, park in the lot next to the abattoir, I would have drawn a total blank. But as with stroppy, abattoir, it turns out, is related to a word I do know, abate, A-B-A-T-E. And if you think about it, hard with triple concentration, you can sort of relate abate to abattoir. Both involve the cessation or lessening of something. I'm sorry, I just wasn't smart enough to make that connection either. Although I do have enough brain cells left in this poor head of mine to take this time to note that my father used to write freelance articles for a magazine called Asbestos Abatement. I'm not kidding, it was about, you know, getting rid of asbestos in old buildings. He'll get a kick out of my memory of this. Shout out to you, Dad. I love you, but I blame you for failing to teach me the word abattoir. You were an English major. Why didn't I know this word? I mean, my ignorance clearly can't be my fault. I don't think it's my fault either that I failed to connect abattoir to abate and then on to slaughterhouse. Where am I going with this? I have been repeatedly told by defenders of exclusive use of the King James Version that certain archaisms in the King James ought to be no trouble to me because a related word exists that ought to solve the difficulty. This happened to me again just the other day. A commenter, who seemed like a sharp guy, thought that people today should know that the archaic you hath he quickened, the word quickened, people should know what that meant in 1611 English, because somewhere at the edges of our language we still sort of have a word quickening, which is used to refer to the time when a child is palpably alive within the womb. I take it, I didn't actually look this one up. Apparently, I ought to have known, according to this commenter, that the quick and the dead in the King James means the alive and the dead, because of a word that old midwives use. I remember hearing or reading Peter Ruckman, the uh, infamous King James only, as taunting his many enemies about something or other in the King James that he claimed they didn't know. Didn't you know that? This, that, or the other, whatever it was, I can't remember. Why didn't you know that? Well, I'll tell you why, Peter Ruckman. It shouldn't be our job as contemporary English speakers and Christians, today's Christians, to learn an older English in order to read God's word given to us. I refuse to blame today's readers for being ignorant of words that died before we were born, before our grandparents were born. Even if those words have living relatives, can you name all four of your great-grandfathers? And yet you're living, why didn't you make the connection? Is God's word for us, or was it really mainly for the Elizabethans? Is it really dumb English, low SAT score English, gutter English to say, he has made you alive, instead of you hath he quickened? Second, BBC shows have reminded me yet again that nearly any set of sounds can come to mean nearly anything. I was watching that same detective show set in Northumberland up near Scotland, and I started noticing that they used the word us where we would use the word me in American English. 
I actually rewound one scene where this was particularly evident, and I took down the sentences verbatim. He taught us everything I know about the industry. That's really bad because that's more like Cockney and they don't speak that way. Sorry. Anyway, you might notice us is pronounced more like us. Just listen to that. He taught us everything I know. The us is singular there, not plural, even though it's followed up with an I, which is singular. Because in that English, in certain contexts, us can be singular. It's very common. Here's another example. I'll just do it in regular American English. He tells us how everything is going to play out, tells us that I need to leave me job. Then he hands us an envelope full of cash. Once again, us is clearly singular in that context. You'll notice also that me is used for my. So maybe, and here I'm 98% spitballing, me took over for my at some point, but that left me doing double duty as a singular objective case pronoun. He taught me and a singular possessive case pronoun. That's my ball. That's me ball. So maybe just maybe us started sneaking in in certain contexts, in many contexts, to serve as an objective case pronoun in the singular. Again, this is a total guess, but it's just the kind of thing that happens in language. I won't give more examples. I'll instead make this application. If the plural, us, as we know it, can come to be used constantly by thousands or millions of people to mean me with no trouble whatsoever and they all understand one another, why can't they cross the line from plural to singular too? It's actually been doing so for centuries, long before the transgenderism craze. Jane Austen did it. Look for yourself. It's convention that makes they and us generally plural in standard American English, but conventions change over time. They are not heaven sent, ironclad. I'm not gonna make any sort of connection between that linguistic observation and Bible translation. Those of you in the know already caught the connection. I'm just gonna go on to my third insight from watching BBC shows. Third, watching these shows with their sometimes wildly differing accents and different words reminded me again that English doesn't have perfect and obvious boundaries around it. It could so, so easily have been another variety of English that gained the ascendancy in Britain or in the good old US of A. Britain actually did have a very different variety of English before the Norman Conquest, a major cultural event which brought a ton of dandy Frenchified words into our mother tongue, words that no longer seem dandy or French to us because they're just English. I've been using tons of such words in this very piece. And what is French? It's Latin that has changed slowly over time. Luke Ranieri, who speaks ancient Latin and ancient Greek, pointed out in a video I just watched recently that French, Spanish, and Italian and other Romance languages derive from Latin. Long ago, they were just considered varieties of vulgar Latin. The ecclesiastical form, the church form of Latin, which was the educated form, had prestige over those other forms, but they were all basically considered one language. It was the rise of nationalism that started making us all see Italian and Spanish and French as different languages. This is why one famous definition of language has it that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. One reason Italian is called Italian and not Latin is that Italy does now exist as a unified country. But Ranieri points out that there's actually a huge number of different dialects of Italian, actually in a very real way of Latin. Uh, these dialects have been spoken in Italy for centuries. And the further they are away from one another, north to south, the less mutually intelligible they are. Each one of these dialects has a history of literature and poetry. We're talking dozens. It just so happens that Dante was able to establish a certain variety of Italian as the prestige form. I think the one from Naples, if I remember, or maybe it was Florence. And now with the rise of mass media, that form predominates and the others are fading. Do a thought experiment with me. If somehow America and Great Britain never buried the hatchet after the War of 1812, and we were still mortal enemies, if we had been on opposite sides in World War I and World War II somehow, which seems impossible to imagine, I know and I'm glad, I feel certain that educated people of both nations, the U.S. and Britain, would still be speaking something recognizably similar to what we all speak today. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if we all insisted that we spoke two different languages. Our two nations did. This is incredibly difficult to imagine. I know that. But what I'm trying to get at here are insights from the field of sociolinguistics. 
language has an unavoidably social element, and it's so natural to us in the U.S. that we hardly think about it. It also bakes in notions of class that we prefer not to think or talk about in polite company, at least in the U.S. But when you see unfamiliar varieties of English on the BBC, you can perhaps approach them with a little more academic detachment. Or try another hot issue right now. One of the first things that I looked up when the war in Ukraine began was the relationship of Ukrainian, the language, to Russian, the language. The two languages have a lot of similarities, apparently. And in fact, can you even imagine this happening in the U.S.? Russian was such a prestige language in Ukraine that the president himself, Volodymyr Zelensky, has had to study Ukrainian. He is a native Russian speaker. In 2020, before he was world famous, before he showed his medal as the leader of his nation, he actually was taken to court for delivering a speech in Russian. Again, can you even imagine something like this in the U.S.? The court initially dismissed the claim, I read, but an appeal was then launched, and the Ukraine Supreme Court's Grand Chamber actually made a ruling that, quote, the president of Ukraine must use the state language, that is Ukrainian, when carrying out his official duties. You just can't imagine Biden or Trump or Obama or Bush or Clinton or Reagan or Carter being told you must use English. Because our languages, Army and Navy, are so powerful that our language has massive worldwide prestige. And almost no one in the U.S. grows up ignorant of English. This is all the stuff that goes through my mind when I watch the BBC. I love God's gift of language. I don't have a Bible verse to explain this time. I'm just observing God's amazing creation, the amazing and fascinating complexities of one of God's greatest gifts to his image bearers, human speech. I do really think that there are connections between all the things I've said about language and the understanding of our Bibles, but this one time I just kind of wanted to nerd out about language, and maybe later I'll make some of those connections. For example, I'll just give you a little teaser here. Why don't we make the Bible say y'all, where the second person pronouns are plural? I'll leave that with you. Duke it out in the comments. Let me end then with a quick thank you to my Patreon supporters. I'll have a list of them on the screen. I am so incredibly grateful for your support. And I really mean this. It means just as much to me that you pray for me and send me little encouraging notes as it does that you support the financial needs of this channel. Thank you so much.